Recorded Books presents 1984 by George Orwell. Narrated by Frank Muller. This work is copyrighted 1949 by the estate of Sonia Brownell Orwell. This recording is copyrighted 1986 by Recorded Books Incorporated. George Orwell wrote 1984 in 1948, and by reversing the last two digits of that year, arrived at the year in which to set his nightmare vision of a world run by the totalitarian state. Orwell was of a generation of socialists who had believed in the Russian Revolution, and had gone to fight for socialism in the Spanish Civil War, and was, like others, vastly disillusioned when word of Stalin's barbarity began to leak to the West. Though 1984 is a denunciation of Stalinism and of Stalin's treatment of truth, that by controlling men's minds, the party controls the truth, it is also a warning to the rest of the world that it is possible to dehumanize man completely and yet for life to go on. In a society that builds machines which act like men and creates men who act like machines, it is possible that you too may come to love Big Brother. And now, 1984. 1. It was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking thirteen. Winston Smith, his chin nuzzled into his breast in an effort to escape the vile wind, slipped quickly through the glass doors of Victory Mansion though not quickly enough to prevent a swirl of gritty dust from entering along with him. The hallway smelt of boiled cabbage and old rag mats. At one end of it a colored poster, too large for indoor display, had been tacked to the wall. It depicted simply an enormous face, more than a meter wide, the face of a man of about forty-five with a heavy black mustache and ruggedly handsome features. Winston made for the stairs. It was no use trying the lift. Even at the best of times it was seldom working, and at present the electric current was cut off during daylight hours. It was part of the economy drive, in preparation for hate week. The flat was seven flights up, and Winston, who was thirty-nine and had a varicose ulcer above his right ankle, went slowly, resting several times on the way. On each landing opposite the lift shaft, the poster with the enormous face gazed from the wall. It was one of those pictures which are so contrived that the eyes follow you about when you move. Big Brother is watching you, the caption beneath it ran. Inside the flat, a fruity voice was reading out a list of figures which had something to do with the production of pig iron. The voice came from an oblong metal plaque like a dulled mirror which formed part of the surface of the right-hand wall. Winston turned a switch and the voice sank somewhat, though the words were still distinguishable. The instrument, the telescreen it was called, could be dimmed, but there was no way of shutting it off completely. He moved over to the window, a smallish, frail figure, the meagerness of his body merely emphasized by the blue overalls which were the uniform of the party. His hair was very fair, his face naturally sanguine, his skin roughened by coarse soap and blunt razor blades and the cold of the winter that had just ended. Outside, even through the shut window pane, the world looked cold. Down in the street little eddies of wind were whirling dust and torn paper into spirals, and though the sun was shining and the sky a harsh blue, there seemed to be no color in anything except the posters that were plastered everywhere. The black mustachioed face gazed down from every commanding corner. There was one on the house front immediately opposite. Big Brother is watching you, the caption said, while the dark eyes looked deep into Winston's own. Down at street level, another poster, torn at one corner, flapped fitfully in the wind, alternately covering and uncovering the single word, Ingsoc. In the far distance, a helicopter skimmed down between the roofs, hovered for an instant like a blue bottle, and darted away again with a curving flight. It was the police patrol snooping into people's windows. The patrols did not matter, however. Only the thought police mattered. Behind Winston's back, the voice from the telescreen was still babbling away about pig iron and the over-fulfillment of the ninth three-year plan. The telescreen received and transmitted simultaneously. Any sound that Winston made above the level of a very low whisper would be picked up by it. Moreover, so long as he remained within the field of vision which the metal plaque commanded, he could be seen as well as heard. There was, of course, no way of knowing whether you were being watched at any given moment. 
How often or on what system the thought police plugged in on any individual wire was guesswork. It was even conceivable that they watched everybody all the time. But at any rate, they could plug in your wire whenever they wanted to. You had to live, did live, from habit that became instinct, and the assumption that every sound you made was overheard, and except in darkness, every movement scrutinized. Winston kept his back turned to the telescreen. It was safer, though, as he well knew, even a back can be revealing. A kilometre away, the Ministry of Truth, his place of work, towered vast and white above the grimy landscape. This, he thought with a sort of vague distaste, this was London, chief city of Airstrip One, itself the third most populous of the provinces of Oceania. He tried to squeeze out some childhood memory that should tell him whether London had always been quite like this, whether always these vistas of rotting nineteenth-century houses, their sides shored up with balks of timber, their windows patched with cardboard and their roofs with corrugated iron, their crazy garden walls sagging in all directions, and the bombed sites where the plaster dust swirled in the air and the willow herbs straggled over the heaps of rubble, and the places where the bombs had cleared a larger path and there had sprung up sordid colonies of wooden dwellings like chicken houses. But it was no use, he could not remember. Nothing remained of his childhood except a series of bright-lit tableaus, occurring against no background and mostly unintelligible. The Ministry of Truth, mini-true in Newspeak, was startlingly different from any other object in sight. It was an enormous pyramidal structure of glittering white concrete, soaring up terrace after terrace, three hundred meters into the air. From where Winston stood it was just possible to read, picked out on its white face in elegant lettering, the three slogans of the party. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. The Ministry of Truth contained, it was said, three thousand rooms above ground level and corresponding ramifications below. Scattered about London there were just three other buildings of similar appearance and size. So completely did they dwarf the surrounding architecture that from the roof of Victory Mansions you could see all four of them simultaneously. They were the homes of the four ministries between which the entire apparatus of government was divided. The Ministry of Truth, which concerned itself with news, entertainment, education, and the fine arts. The Ministry of Peace, which concerned itself with war. The Ministry of Love, which maintained law and order. And the Ministry of Plenty, which was responsible for economic affairs. Their names in Newspeak, Mini True, Mini Pax, Mini Love, and Mini Plenty. The Ministry of Love was the really frightening one. There were no windows in it at all. Winston had never been inside the Ministry of Love, nor within half a kilometre of it. It was a place impossible to enter except on official business, and then only by penetrating through a maze of barbed wire entanglement, steel doors, and hidden machine-gun nests. Even the streets leading up to its outer barriers were roamed by gorilla-faced guards in black uniforms, armed with jointed truncheons. Winston turned round abruptly. He had set his features into the expression of quiet optimism which it was advisable to wear when facing the telescreen. He crossed the room into the tiny kitchen. By leaving the ministry at this time of day he had sacrificed his lunch in the canteen, and he was aware that there was no food in the kitchen except a hunk of dark-coloured bread which had got to be saved for tomorrow's breakfast. He took down from the shelf a bottle of colourless liquid with a plain white label marked Victory Gin. It gave off a sickly, oily smell as of Chinese rice spirit. Winston poured out nearly a teacupful, nerved himself for a shock, and gulped it down like a dose of medicine. Instantly his face turned scarlet and the water ran out of his eyes. The stuff was like nitric acid, and moreover in swallowing it one had the sensation of being hit on the back of the head with a rubber club. The next moment, however, the burning in his belly died down and the world began to look more cheerful. He took a cigarette from a crumpled packet marked Victory Cigarettes and incautiously held it upright, whereupon the tobacco fell out onto the floor. With the next he was more successful. He went back to the living room and sat down at a small table that stood to the left of the telescreen. From the table drawer he took out a pen holder, a bottle of ink, and a thick quarto-sized blank book with a red back and a marbled cover. For some reason the telescreen in the living room was in an unusual position. Instead of being placed, as was normal, in the end wall, where it could command the whole room, it was in the longer wall, opposite the window. 
To one side of it there was a shallow alcove in which Winston was now sitting, and which, when the flats were built, had probably been intended to hold bookshelves. By sitting in the alcove and keeping well back, Winston was able to remain outside the range of the telescreen, so far as sight went. He could be heard, of course, but so long as he stayed in his present position he could not be seen. It was partly the unusual geography of the room that had suggested to him the thing that he was now about to do. But it had also been suggested by the book that he had just taken out of the drawer. It was a peculiarly beautiful book. Its smooth, creamy paper, a little yellowed by age, was of a kind that had not been manufactured for at least forty years past. He could guess, however, that the book was much older than that. He had seen it lying in the window of a frowsy little junk shop in a slummy quarter of the town, just what quarter he did not now remember, and had been stricken immediately by an overwhelming desire to possess it. Party members were supposed not to go into ordinary shops, dealing on the free market it was called, but the rule was not strictly kept, because there were various things, such as shoelaces and razor blades, which it was impossible to get hold of in any other way. He had given a quick glance up and down the street, and then had slipped inside and bought the book for two dollars fifty. At the time he was not conscious of wanting it for any particular purpose. He had carried it guiltily home in his briefcase. Even with nothing written in it, it was a compromising possession. The thing that he was about to do was to open a diary. This was not illegal. Nothing was illegal, since there were no longer any laws. But if detected, it was reasonably certain that it would be punished by death, or at least by twenty-five years in a forced labor camp. Winston fitted a nib into the pen holder and sucked it to get the grease off. The pen was an archaic instrument, seldom used even for signatures and he had procured one, furtively and with some difficulty, simply because of a feeling that the beautiful creamy paper deserved to be written on with a real nib instead of being scratched with an ink pencil. Actually, he was not used to writing by hand. Apart from very short notes, it was usual to dictate everything into the speak-write, which was, of course, impossible for his present purpose. He dipped the pen into the ink and then faltered for just a second. A tremor had gone through his bowels. To mark the paper was the decisive act. In small, clumsy letters he wrote, April 4th, 1984. He sat back. A sense of complete helplessness had descended upon him. To begin with, he did not know with any certainty that this was 1984. It must be round that date, since he was fairly sure that his age was thirty-nine, and he believed that he had been born in 1944 or 1945, but it was never possible nowadays to pin down any date within a year or two. For whom it suddenly occurred to him to wonder was he writing this diary? For the future, for the unborn. His mind hovered for a moment round the doubtful date on the page, and then fetched up with a bump against the new speak word doublethink. For the first time the magnitude of what he had undertaken came home to him. How could you communicate with the future? It was, of its nature, impossible. Either the future would resemble the present, in which case it would not listen to him, or it would be different from it, and his predicament would be meaningless. For some time he sat, gazing stupidly at the paper. The telescreen had changed over to strident military music. It was curious that he seemed not merely to have lost the power of expressing himself, but even to have forgotten what it was that he had originally intended to say. For weeks past he had been making ready for this moment, and it had never crossed his mind that anything would be needed except courage. The actual writing would be easy. All he had to do was transfer to paper the interminable, restless monologue that had been running inside his head literally for years. At this moment, however, even the monologue had dried up. Moreover, his varicose ulcer had begun itching unbearably. He dared not scratch it, because if he did so it always became inflamed. The seconds were ticking by. He was conscious of nothing except the blankness of the page in front of him, the itching of the skin above his ankle, the blaring of the music, and a slight booziness caused by the gin. Suddenly he began writing in sheer panic, only imperfectly aware of what he was setting down. His small but childish handwriting straggled up and down the page, shedding first its capital letters and then finally even its full stops. April 4th, 1984. Last night to the flicks. All war films. One very good one of a ship full of refugees being bombed somewhere in the Mediterranean. 
audience much amused by shots of a great huge fat man trying to swim away with a helicopter after him. First you saw him wallowing along in the water like a porpoise, then you saw him through the helicopter's gun sights, then he was full of holes and the sea round him turned pink and he sank as suddenly as though the holes had led in the water, audience shouting with laughter when he sank. Then you saw a lifeboat full of children with a helicopter hovering over it. There was a middle-aged woman, might have been a Jewess, sitting up in the bow with a little boy about three years old in her arms, little boy screaming with fright and hiding his head between her breasts as if he was trying to burrow right into her, and the woman putting her arms around him and comforting him, although she was blue with fright herself, all the time covering him up as much as possible as if she thought her arms could keep the bullets off him. Then the helicopter planted a twenty-kilo bomb in among them, terrific flash, and the boat went all to matchwood. Then there was a wonderful shot of a child's arm going up, 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 right up into the air. A helicopter with a camera in its nose must have followed it up, and there was a lot of applause from the party seats. But a woman down in the prole part of the house suddenly started kicking up a fuss and shouting they didn't ought to have showed it, not in front of the kids. They didn't. It ain't right. Not in front of kids. It ain't. Until the police turned her out. I don't suppose anything happened to her. Nobody cares what the prole say. Typical prole reaction. They never... Winston stopped writing partly because he was suffering from cramp. He did not know what had made him pour out this stream of rubbish. But the curious thing was that while he was doing so, a totally different memory had clarified itself in his mind, to the point where he almost felt equal to writing it down. It was, he now realized because of this other incident, that he had suddenly decided to come home and begin the diary today. It had happened that morning at the Ministry, if anything so nebulous could be said to happen, it was nearly eleven hundred, and in the records department where Winston worked they were dragging the chairs out of the cubicles and grouping them in the center of the hall, opposite the big telescreen, in preparation for the two minutes' hate. Winston was just taking his place in one of the middle rows when two people, whom he knew by sight but had never spoken to, came unexpectedly into the room. One of them was a girl whom he often passed in the corridors. He did not know her name, but he knew that she worked in the fiction department. Presumably, since he had sometimes seen her with oily hands and carrying a spanner, she had some mechanical job on one of the novel-writing machines. She was a bold-looking girl of about twenty-seven, with thick dark hair, a freckled face, and swift athletic movements. A narrow scarlet sash, emblem of the junior anti-sex league, was wound several times around the waist of her overalls, just tightly enough to bring out the shapeliness of her hips. Winston had disliked her from the very first moment of seeing her. He knew the reason. It was because of the atmosphere of hockey fields and cold baths and community hikes and general clean-mindedness which she managed to carry about with her. He disliked nearly all women, and especially the young and pretty ones. It was always the women, and above all the young ones, who were the most bigoted adherents of the party, the swallowers of slogans, the amateur spies, and nosers out of unorthodoxy. But this particular girl gave him the impression of being more dangerous than most. Once, when they passed in the corridor, she had given him a quick, sidelong glance, which seemed to pierce right into him, and for a moment had filled him with black terror. The idea had even crossed his mind that she might be an agent of the Thought Police. That, it was true, was very unlikely. Still, he continued to feel a peculiar uneasiness, which had fear mixed up in it as well as hostility, whenever she was anywhere near him. The other person was a man named O'Brien, a member of the inner party and holder of some post so important and remote Winston had only a dim idea of its nature. A momentary hush passed over the group of people round the chairs as they saw the black overalls of an inner party member approaching. O'Brien was a large, burly man with a thick neck and a coarse, humorous, brutal face. In spite of his formidable appearance, he had a certain charm of manner. He had a trick of resettling his spectacles on his nose, which was curiously disarming, in some indefinable way curiously civilized. It was a gesture which, if anyone had still thought in such terms, might have recalled an eighteenth-century nobleman offering his snuff-box. Winston had seen O'Brien perhaps a dozen times in almost as many years. He felt deeply drawn to him, and not solely because he was intrigued by the contrast between O'Brien's urbane manner and his prize-fighter's physique. Much more it was because of a secretly held belief, or perhaps not even a belief, merely a hope, that O'Brien's political orthodoxy was not perfect. Something in his face suggested it, irresistibly. And again, perhaps it was not even unorthodoxy that was written in his face, but simply intelligence. 
But, at any rate, he had the appearance of being a person that you could talk to, if somehow you could cheat the telescreen and get him alone. Winston had never made the smallest effort to verify this guess. Indeed, there was no way of doing so. At this moment O'Brien glanced at his wristwatch, saw that it was nearly eleven hundred, and evidently decided to stay in the records department until the two minutes' hate was over. He took a chair in the same row as Winston, a couple of places away. A small, sandy-haired woman who worked in the next cubicle to Winston was between them. The girl with dark hair was sitting immediately behind. The next moment a hideous, grinding screech, as of some monstrous machine running without oil, burst from the big telescreen at the end of the room. It was a noise that set one's teeth on edge and bristled the hair at the back of one's neck. The hate had started. As usual, the face of Emmanuel Goldstein, the enemy of the people, had flashed onto the screen. There were hisses here and there among the audience. The little sandy-haired woman gave a squeak of mingled fear and disgust. Goldstein was the renegade and backslider who once, long ago, how long ago, nobody quite remembered, had been one of the leading figures of the party, almost on a level with Big Brother himself, and then had engaged in counter-revolutionary activities, had been condemned to death and had mysteriously escaped and disappeared. The program of the two minutes' hate varied from day to day, but there was none in which Goldstein was not the principal figure. He was the primal traitor, the earliest defiler of the party's purity. All subsequent crimes against the party, all treacheries, acts of sabotage, heresies, deviations, sprang directly out of his teaching. Somewhere or other he was still alive and hatching his conspiracies, perhaps somewhere beyond the sea under the protection of his foreign paymasters, perhaps even, so it was occasionally rumoured, in some hiding place in Oceania itself. Winston's diaphragm was constricted. He could never see the face of Goldstein without a painful mixture of emotions. It was a lean Jewish face with a great fuzzy aureole of white hair and a small goatee beard, a clever face and yet somehow inherently despicable, with a kind of senile silliness in the long, thin nose near the end of which a pair of spectacles was perched. It resembled the face of a sheep, and the voice, too, had a sheep-like quality. Goldstein was delivering his usual venomous attack upon the doctrines of the party, an attack so exaggerated and perverse that a child should have been able to see through it, and yet just plausible enough to fill one with an alarmed feeling that other people, less level-headed than oneself, might be taken in by it. He was abusing Big Brother, he was denouncing the dictatorship of the party, he was demanding the immediate conclusion of peace with Eurasia, he was advocating freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of thought, he was crying hysterically that the revolution had been betrayed, and all this in rapid, polysyllabic speech, which was a sort of parody of the habitual style of the orators of the party, and even contained newspeak words, more newspeak words indeed than any party member would normally use in real life. And all the while, lest one should be in any doubt as to the reality which Goldstein's specious claptrap covered, behind his head on the telescreen there marched the endless columns of the Eurasian army, Row after row of solid-looking men with expressionless Asiatic faces who swam up to the surface of the screen and vanished, to be replaced by others exactly similar. The dull, rhythmic tramp of the soldiers' boots formed the background to Goldstein's bleating voice. Before the hate had proceeded for thirty seconds, uncontrollable exclamations of rage were breaking out from half the people in the room. The self-satisfied, sheep-like face on the screen and the terrifying power of the Eurasian army behind it were too much to be borne. Besides, the sight or even the thought of Goldstein produced fear and anger automatically. He was an object of hatred more constant than either Eurasia or East Asia, since when Oceania was at war with one of these powers it was generally at peace with the other. But what was strange was that although Goldstein was hated and despised by everybody, although every day and a thousand times a day on platforms, on the telescreen, in newspapers, in books, his theories were refuted, smashed, ridiculed, held up to the general gaze for the pitiful rubbish that they were, in spite of all of this, his influence never seemed to grow less. Always there were fresh dupes waiting to be seduced by him. A day never passed when spies and saboteurs acting under his directions were not unmasked by the thought police. He was the commander of a vast, shadowy army, an underground network of conspirators dedicated to the overthrow of the state. The Brotherhood, its name was supposed to be. 
There were also whispered stories of a terrible book, a compendium of all the heresies of which Goldstein was the author and which circulated clandestinely here and there. It was a book without a title. People referred to it, if at all, simply as The Book. But one knew of such things only through vague rumours. Neither the Brotherhood nor the Book was a subject that any ordinary party member would mention if there was a way of avoiding it. In its second minute the hate rose to a frenzy. People were leaping up and down in their places and shouting at the tops of their voices in an effort to drown the maddening, bleating voice that came from the screen. The little sandy-haired woman had turned bright pink, and her mouth was opening and shutting like that of a landed fish. Even O'Brien's heavy face was flushed. He was sitting very straight in his chair, his powerful chest swelling and quivering as though he were standing up to the assault of a wave. The dark-haired girl behind Winston had begun crying out, "'Swine! Swine! Swine!' And suddenly she picked up a heavy Newspeak dictionary and flung it at the screen. It struck Goldstein's nose and bounced off. The voice continued inexorably. In a lucid moment Winston found that he was shouting with the others and kicking his heel violently against the rung of his chair. A horrible thing about the two minutes' hate was not that one was obliged to act a part, but that it was impossible to avoid joining in. Within thirty seconds any pretense was always unnecessary. A hideous ecstasy of fear and vindictiveness, a desire to kill, to torture, to smash faces in with a sledgehammer, seemed to flow through the whole group of people like an electric current, turning one even against one's will into a grimacing, screaming lunatic. And yet the rage that one felt was an abstract, undirected emotion, which could be switched from one object to another like the flame of a blow-lamp. Thus, at one moment Winston's hatred was not turned against Goldstein at all, but on the contrary, against Big Brother, the party, and the Thought Police. And at such moments his heart went out to the lonely, derided heretic on the screen, sole guardian of truth and sanity in a world of lies. And yet the very next instant he was at one with the people about him, and all that was said of Goldstein seemed to him to be true. At those moments his secret loathing of Big Brother changed into adoration, and Big Brother seemed to tower up, an invincible, fearless protector, standing like a rock against the hordes of Asia, and Goldstein, in spite of his isolation, his helplessness, and the doubt that hung about his very existence, seemed like some sinister enchanter, capable by the mere power of his voice of wrecking the structure of civilization. It was even possible at moments to switch one's hatred this way or that by a voluntary act. Suddenly, by the sort of violent effort with which one wrenches one's head away from the pillow in a nightmare, Winston succeeded in transferring his hatred from the face on the screen to the dark-haired girl behind him. Vivid, beautiful hallucinations flashed through his mind. He would flog her to death with a rubber truncheon. He would tie her naked to a stake and shoot her full of arrows like St. Sebastian. He would ravish her and cut her throat at the moment of climax. Better than before, moreover, he realized why it was that he hated her. He hated her because she was young and pretty and sexless, because he wanted to go to bed with her and would never do so, because round her sweet, supple waist, which seemed to ask you to encircle it with your arm, there was only the odious scarlet sash, aggressive symbol of chastity. The hate rose to its climax. The voice of Goldstein had become an actual sheep's bleat, and for an instant the face changed into that of a sheep. Then the sheep face melted into the figure of a Eurasian soldier who seemed to be advancing, huge and terrible, his submachine gun roaring and seeming to spring out of the surface of the screen, so that some of the people in the front row actually flinched backwards in their seats. But in the same moment, drawing a deep sigh of relief from everybody, the hostile figure melted into the face of Big Brother. Black-haired, black-mustachioed, full of power and mysterious calm, and so vast that it almost filled up the screen. Nobody heard what Big Brother was saying. It was merely a few words of encouragement, the sort of words that are uttered in the din of battle, not distinguishable individually, but restoring confidence by the fact of being spoken. Then the face of Big Brother faded away again, and instead the three slogans of the party stood out in bold capitals. War is peace. Freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. But the face of Big Brother seemed to persist for several seconds on the screen, as though the impact that it had made on everyone's eyeballs were too vivid to wear off immediately. The little sandy-haired woman had flung herself forward over the back of the chair in front of her. With a tremulous murmur that sounded like, My Savior, she extended her arms toward the screen, and she buried her face in her hands. 
it was apparent that she was uttering a prayer. At this moment the entire group of people broke into a deep, slow, rhythmical chant of B, 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 over and over again, very slowly, with a long pause between the first B and the second, a heavy, murmurous sound, somehow curiously savage, in the background of which one seemed to hear a stamp of naked feet and the throbbing of tom-toms. For perhaps as much as thirty seconds they kept it up. It was a refrain that was often heard in moments of overwhelming emotion. Partly it was a sort of hymn to the wisdom and majesty of Big Brother, but still more it was an act of self-hypnosis, a deliberate drowning of consciousness by means of rhythmic noise. Winston's entrails seemed to grow cold. In the two minutes Haiti could not help sharing in the general delirium, but this subhuman chanting of B, 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 B always filled him with horror. Of course, he chanted with the rest. It was impossible to do otherwise. To dissemble your feelings, to control your face, to do what everyone else was doing was an instinctive reaction. But there was a space of a couple of seconds during which the expression in his eyes might conceivably have betrayed him. And it was exactly at this moment that the significant thing happened. If indeed it did happen. Momentarily, he caught O'Brien's eye. O'Brien had stood up. He had taken off his spectacles and was in the act of resettling them on his nose with his characteristic gesture. But there was a fraction of a second when their eyes met. And for as long as it took to happen, Winston knew, yes, he knew, that O'Brien was thinking the same thing as himself. An unmistakable message had passed. It was as though their two minds had opened and the thoughts were flowing from one into the other through their eyes. I am with you. O'Brien seemed to be saying to him, I know precisely what you are feeling. I know all about your contempt, your hatred, your disgust. But don't worry. I am on your side. And then the flash of intelligence was gone, and O'Brien's face was as inscrutable as everybody else's. That was all. And he was already uncertain whether it had happened. Such incidents never had any sequel. All that they did was to keep alive in him the belief or hope that others beside himself were the enemies of the party. Perhaps the rumors of vast underground conspiracies were true, after all. Perhaps the Brotherhood really existed. It was impossible, in spite of the endless arrests and confessions and executions, to be sure that the Brotherhood was not simply a myth. Some days he believed in it, some days not. There was no evidence, only fleeting glimpses that might mean anything or nothing. Snatches of overheard conversation, faint scribbles on lavatory walls, once even when two strangers met a small movement of the hands, which had looked as though it might be a signal of recognition. It was all guesswork. Very likely he had imagined everything. He had gone back to his cubicle without looking at O'Brien again. The idea of following up their momentary contact hardly crossed his mind. It would have been inconceivably dangerous, even if he had known how to set about doing it. For a second, two seconds, they had exchanged an equivocal glance, and that was the end of the story. But even that was a memorable event in the locked loneliness in which one had to live. Winston roused himself and sat up straighter. He let out a belch. The gin was rising from his stomach. His eyes refocused on the page. He discovered that while he sat helplessly musing, he had also been writing, as though by automatic action. And it was no longer the same cramped, awkward handwriting as before. His pen had slid voluptuously over the smooth paper, printing in large, neat capitals, Down with Big Brother, 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 over and over again, filling half a page. He could not help feeling a twinge of panic. It was absurd since the writing of those particular words was not more dangerous than the initial act of opening the diary. But for a moment he was tempted to tear out the spoiled pages and abandon the enterprise altogether. But he did not do so, however, because he knew that it was useless. Whether he wrote down with Big Brother or whether he refrained from writing it made no difference. Whether he went on with the diary or whether he did not go on with it made no difference. The thought police would get him just the same. He had committed, would still have committed, even if he had never set pen to paper, the essential crime that contained all others in itself. Thought crime, they called it. 
Thought crime was not a thing that could be concealed for ever. You might dodge successfully for a while, even for years, but sooner or later they were bound to get you. It was always at night. The arrests invariably happened at night. The sudden jerk out of sleep, the rough hand shaking your shoulder, the lights glaring in your eyes, the ring of hard faces round the bed. In the vast majority of cases there was no trial, no report of the arrest. People simply disappeared, always during the night. Your name was removed from the register. Every record of everything you had ever done was wiped out. Your one-time existence was denied and then forgotten. You were abolished, annihilated, vaporized, was the usual word. For a moment he was seized by a kind of hysteria. He began writing in a hurried, untidy scrawl. They'll shoot me, I don't care. They'll shoot me in the back of the neck, I don't care. Down with Big Brother. They always shoot you in the back of the neck, I don't care. Down with Big Brother. He sat back in his chair, slightly ashamed of himself, and laid down his pen. The next moment he started violently. There was a knocking at his door. Already! He sat as still as a mouse in the futile hope that whoever it was might go away after a single attempt. But no, the knocking was repeated. The worst thing of all would be to delay. His heart was thumping like a drum, but his face from long habit was probably expressionless. He got up and moved heavily toward the door. Chapter 2 As he put his hand to the doorknob, Winston saw that he had left the diary open on the table. Down with Big Brother was written all over it, in letters almost big enough to be legible across the room. It was an inconceivably stupid thing to have done. But... He realized even in his panic he had not wanted to smudge the creamy paper by shutting the book while the ink was wet. He drew in his breath and opened the door. Instantly a warm wave of relief flowed through him. A colorless, crushed-looking woman with wispy hair and a lined face was standing outside. "'Oh, comrade,' she began in a dreary, whining sort of voice, "'I thought I heard you come in. Do you think you could come across and have a look at our kitchen sink? It's got blocked up and... It was Mrs. Parsons, the wife of a neighbor on the same floor. Mrs. was a word somewhat discountenanced by the party you were supposed to call everyone comrade, but with some women one used it instinctively. She was a woman of about thirty, but looking much older. One had the impression that there was dust in the creases of her face. Winston followed her down the passage. These amateur repair jobs were an almost daily irritation. Victory mansions were old flats built in 1930 or thereabouts, and were falling to pieces. The plaster flaked constantly from ceilings and walls, the pipes burst in every hard frost, the roof leaked whenever there was snow, the heating system was usually running at half steam when it was not closed down altogether for motives of economy. Repairs, except what you could do yourself, had to be sanctioned by remote committees, which were liable to hold up even the mending of a window pane for two years. "'Of course, it's only because Tom isn't home,' said Mrs. Parsons vaguely. The Parsons' flat was bigger than Winston's, and dingy in a different way. Everything had a battered, trampled-on look, as though the place had just been visited by some large, violent animal. Games impedimenta, hockey sticks, boxing gloves, a burst football, a pair of sweaty shorts turned inside out lay all over the floor, and on the table there was a litter of dirty dishes and dog-eared exercise books. On the walls were scarlet banners of the Youth League and the Spies, and a full-sized poster of Big Brother. There was the usual boiled cabbage smell, common to the whole building, but it was shot through by a sharper reek of sweat, which, one knew this at the first sniff, though it was hard to say how, was the sweat of some person not present at the moment. In another room, someone with a comb and a piece of toilet paper was trying to keep tune with the military music, which was still issuing from the telescreen. "'It's the children,' said Mrs. Parsons, casting a half-apprehensive glance at the door. "'They haven't been out today.' And, of course, she had a habit of breaking off her sentences in the middle. The kitchen sink was full, nearly to the brim, with filthy greenish water which smelt worse than ever of cabbage. Winston knelt down and examined the angle joint of the pipe. He hated using his hands, and he hated bending down, which was always liable to start him coughing. Mrs. Parsons looked on helplessly. Of course, if Tom was home, he'd put it right in a moment she said. He loves anything like that. He's ever so good with his hands, Tom is. Parsons was Winston's fellow employee at the Ministry of Truth. He was a fattish but active man of paralyzing stupidity. 
a mass of imbecile enthusiasms, one of those completely unquestioning, devoted drudges on whom, more even than on the thought police, the stability of the party depended. At thirty-five he had just been unwillingly evicted from the Youth League, and before graduating into the Youth League he had managed to stay on in the spies for a year beyond the statutory age. At the Ministry he was employed in some subordinate post for which intelligence was not required, but on the other hand he was a leading figure on the Sports Committee and all the other committees engaged in organizing community hikes, spontaneous demonstrations, saving campaigns, and voluntary activities generally. He would inform you with quiet pride between whiffs of his pipe that he had put in an appearance at the community centre every evening for the past four years. An overpowering smell of sweat, a sort of unconscious testimony to the strenuousness of his life, followed him about wherever he went, and even remained behind him after he had gone. "'Have you got a spanner?' said Winston, fiddling with the nut on the angle joint. "'A spanner,' said Mrs. Parsons, immediately becoming invertebrate. "'I don't know, I'm sure. Perhaps the children—' There was a trampling of boots and another blast on the comb as the children charged into the living room. Mrs. Parsons brought the spanner. Winston let out the water and disgustedly removed the clot of human hair that had blocked up the pipe. He cleaned his fingers as best he could in the cold water from the tap and went back into the other room. "'Up with your hands!' yelled a savage voice. A handsome, tough-looking boy of nine had popped up from behind the table and was menacing him with a toy automatic pistol, while his small sister, about two years younger, made the same gesture with a fragment of wood. Both of them were dressed in the blue shorts, grey shirts, and red neckerchiefs which were the uniform of the spies. Winston raised his hands above his head, but with an uneasy feeling. So vicious was the boy's demeanour that it was not altogether a game. "'You're a traitor!' yelled the boy. "'You're a thought criminal! You're a Eurasian spy! I'll shoot you! I'll vaporize you! I'll send you to the salt mines!' Suddenly they were both leaping around him, shouting, "'Traitor!' and "'Thought criminal!' the little girl imitating her brother in every movement. It was somehow slightly frightening, like the gambling of tiger cubs which will soon grow up into man-eaters. There was a sort of calculating ferocity in the boy's eye, a quite evident desire to hit or kick Winston, and a consciousness of being very nearly big enough to do so. It was a good job it was not a real pistol he was holding, Winston thought. Mrs. Parsons' eyes flitted nervously from Winston to the children and back again. In the better light of the living room he noticed with interest that there actually was dust in the creases of her face. "'They do get so noisy,' she said. They're disappointed because they couldn't go to see the hanging, that's what it is. I'm too busy to take them, and Tom won't be back from work in time. Why can't we go and see the hanging? roared the boy in his huge voice. Want to see the hanging? Want to see the hanging? chanted the little girl, still capering around. Some Eurasian prisoners guilty of war crimes were to be hanged in the park that evening, Winston remembered. This happened about once a month, and it was a popular spectacle. Children always clamoured to be taken to see it. He took his leave of Mrs. Parsons and made for the door. But he had not gone six steps down the passage when something hit the back of his neck an agonizingly painful blow. It was as though a red-hot wire had been jabbed into him. He spun round just in time to see Mrs. Parsons dragging her son back into the doorway while the boy pocketed a catapult. "'Goldstein!' bellowed the boy as the door closed on him. But what most struck Winston was the look of helpless fright on the woman's greyish face. Back in the flat he stepped quickly past the telescreen and sat down at the table again, still rubbing his neck. The music from the telescreen had stopped. Instead a clipped military voice was reading out with a sort of brutal relish a description of the armaments of the new floating fortress which had just been anchored between Iceland and the Faroe Islands. With those children, he thought, that wretched woman must lead a life of terror. Another year, two years, and they would be watching her night and day for symptoms of unorthodoxy. Nearly all children nowadays were horrible. What was worst of all was that by means of such organizations as the spies they were systematically turned into ungovernable little savages, and yet this produced in them no tendency whatever to rebel against the discipline of the party. On the contrary, they adored the party and everything connected with it. The songs, the processions, the banners, the hiking, the drilling with dummy rifles, the yelling of slogans, the worship of Big Brother. It was all a sort of glorious game to them. All their ferocity was turned outwards, against the enemies of the state, against foreigners, traitors, saboteurs, thought criminals. It was almost normal for people over thirty to be frightened of their own children, and with good reason. 
for hardly a week passed in which the Times did not carry a paragraph describing how some eavesdropping little sneak, child hero was the phrase generally used, had overheard some compromising remark and denounced his parents to the thought police. The sting of the catapult bullet had worn off. He picked up his pen half-heartedly, wondering whether he could find something more to write in the diary. Suddenly he began thinking of O'Brien again. Years ago, how long was it? Seven years, it must be. He had dreamed that he was walking through a pitch-dark room, and someone sitting to one side of him had said as he passed, We shall meet in the place where there is no darkness. It was said very quietly, almost casually. A statement, not a command. He had walked on without pausing. What was curious was that, at the time, in the dream, the words had not made much impression on him. It was only later, and by degrees, that they had seemed to take on significance. He could not now remember whether it was before or after having the dream that he had seen O'Brien for the first time, nor could he remember when he had first identified the voice as O'Brien's. But at any rate the identification existed. It was O'Brien who had spoken to him out of the dark. Winston had never been able to feel sure, even after this morning's flash of the eyes, it was still impossible to be sure whether O'Brien was a friend or an enemy. Nor did it even seem to matter greatly. There was a link of understanding between them, more important than affection or partisanship. We shall meet in the place where there is no darkness, he had said. Winston did not know what it meant, only that in some way or another it would come true. The voice from the telescreen paused. A trumpet call, clear and beautiful, floated into the stagnant air. The voice continued raspingly. Attention, your attention, please. A news flash has this moment arrived from the Malabar front. Our forces in South India have won a glorious victory. I am authorized to say that the action we are now reporting may well bring the war within measurable distance of its end. Here is the news flash. Bad news coming, thought Winston. And sure enough, following on a gory description of the annihilation of a Eurasian army with stupendous figures of killed and prisoners, came the announcement that, as from next week, the chocolate ration would be reduced from thirty grams to twenty. Winston belched again. The gin was wearing off, leaving a deflated feeling. The telescreen, perhaps to celebrate the victory, perhaps to drown the memory of the lost chocolate, crashed into, Oceania, tis for thee. You were supposed to stand to attention. However, in his present position he was invisible. Oceania, tis for thee, gave way to lighter music. Winston walked over to the window, keeping his back to the telescreen. The day was still cold and clear. Somewhere far away a rocket bomb exploded with a dull, reverberating roar. About twenty or thirty of them a week were falling on London at present. Down in the street the wind flapped the torn poster to and fro, and the word Ingsoc fitfully appeared and vanished. Ingsoc. The sacred principles of Ingsoc. New speak double-think, the mutability of the past. He felt as though he were wandering in the forests of the sea-bottom, lost in a monstrous world where he himself was the monster. He was alone. The past was dead. The future was unimaginable. What certainty had he that a single human creature now living was on his side? And what way of knowing that the dominion of the party would not endure for ever? Like an answer, the three slogans on the white face of the Ministry of Truth came back at him. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. He took a twenty-five-cent piece out of his pocket. There, too, in tiny, clear lettering, the same slogans were inscribed, and on the other face of the coin the head of Big Brother. Even from the coin the eyes pursued you on coins, on stamps, on the covers of books, on banners, on posters, and on the wrapping of a cigarette packet, everywhere. Always the eyes watching you and the voice enveloping you, asleep or awake, working or eating, indoors or out of doors, in the bath or in bed, no escape. Nothing was your own except the few cubic centimeters inside your skull. The sun had shifted round in the myriad windows of the Ministry of Truth, but the light no longer shining on them looked grim as the loopholes of a fortress. His heart quailed before the enormous pyramidal shape. It was too strong, it could not be stormed. A thousand rocket bombs would not batter it down. He wondered again for whom he was writing the diary. For the future, for the past, 
or an age that might be imaginary. And in front of him there lay not death, but annihilation. The diary would be reduced to ashes and himself to vapour. Only the thought police would read what he had written before they wiped it out of existence and out of memory. How could you make an appeal to the future when not a trace of you, not even an anonymous word scribbled on a piece of paper, could physically survive? The telescreen struck fourteen. He must leave in ten minutes. He had to be back at work by fourteen-thirty. Curiously, the chiming of the hour seemed to have put new heart into him. He was a lonely ghost, uttering a truth that nobody would ever hear. But so long as he uttered it in some obscure way, the continuity was not broken. It was not by making yourself heard, but by staying sane, that you carried on the human heritage. He went back to the table, dipped his pen, and wrote, To the future, or to the past, to a time when thought is free, when men are different from one another and do not live alone, to a time when truth exists and what is done cannot be undone, from the age of uniformity, from the age of solitude, from the age of big brother, from the age of double-think, greetings. He was already dead, he reflected. It seemed to him that it was only now, when he had begun to be able to formulate his thoughts, that he had taken the decisive step. The consequences of every act are included in the act itself. He wrote, Thought crime does not entail death. Thought crime is death. Now that he had recognized himself as a dead man, it became important to stay alive as long as possible. Two fingers of his right hand were ink-stained. It was exactly the kind of detail that might betray you. Some nosing zealot in the ministry, a woman probably, someone like the little sandy-haired woman or the dark-haired girl from the fiction department, might start wondering why he had been writing during the lunch interval, why he had used an old-fashioned pen, what he had been writing, and then drop a hint in the appropriate quarter. He went to the bathroom and carefully scrubbed the ink away with the gritty dark-brown soap which rasped your skin like sandpaper, and was therefore well adapted for this purpose. He put the diary away in the drawer. It was quite useless to think of hiding it. But he could at least make sure whether or not its existence had been discovered. A hair laid across the page ends was too obvious. With the tip of his finger he picked up an identifiable grain of whitish dust and deposited it on the corner of the cover, where it was bound to be shaken off if the book was moved. Chapter 3 Winston was dreaming of his mother. He must, he thought, have been ten or eleven years old when his mother had disappeared. She was a tall, statuesque, rather silent woman with slow movements and magnificent fair hair. His father he remembered more vaguely as dark and thin, dressed always in neat dark clothes. Winston remembered especially the very thin soles of his father's shoes and wearing spectacles. The two of them must evidently have been swallowed up in one of the first great purges of the fifties. At that moment his mother was sitting in some place deep down beneath him, with his young sister in her arms. He did not remember his sister at all, except as a tiny, feeble baby, always silent, with large, watchful eyes. Both of them were looking up at him. They were down in some subterranean place, the bottom of a well, for instance, or a very deep grave. But it was a place which, already far below him, was itself moving downwards. They were in the saloon of a sinking ship, looking up at him through the darkening water. There was still air in the saloon, they could still see him, and he them. But all the while they were sinking down, down into the green waters which in another moment must hide them from sight forever. He was out in the light and air while they were being sucked down to death, and they were down there because he was up here. He knew it, and they knew it, and he could see the knowledge in their faces. There was no reproach, either in their faces or in their hearts, only the knowledge that they must die in order that he might remain alive, and that this was part of the unavoidable order of things. He could not remember what had happened. But he knew in his dream that in some way the lives of his mother and his sister had been sacrificed to his own. It was one of those dreams which, while retaining the characteristic dream scenery, are a continuation of one's intellectual life, and in which one becomes aware of facts and ideas which still seem new and valuable after one is awake. The thing that now suddenly struck Winston was that his mother's death, nearly thirty years ago, had been tragic and sorrowful in a way that was no longer possible. Tragedy, he perceived, belonged to the ancient time. 
to a time when there was still privacy, love and friendship, and when the members of a family stood by one another without needing to know the reason. His mother's memory tore at his heart because she had died loving him when he was too young and selfish to love her in return, and because somehow he did not remember how she had sacrificed herself to a conception of loyalty that was private and unalterable. Such things, he saw, could not happen today. Today there were fear, hatred and pain, but no dignity of emotion or deep or complex sorrows. All this he seemed to see in the large eyes of his mother and his sister, looking up at him through the green water, hundreds of fathoms down and still sinking. Suddenly he was standing on short, springy turf, on a summer evening, when the slanting rays of the sun gilded the ground. The landscape that he was looking at recurred so often in his dreams that he was never fully certain whether or not he had seen it in the real world. In his waking thoughts he called it the Golden Country. It was an old, rabbit-bitten pasture, with a foot-track wandering across it, and a mole-hole here and there. In the ragged hedge on the opposite side of the field the boughs of the elm-trees were swaying very faintly in the breeze, their leaves just stirring in dense masses like woman's hair. Somewhere near at hand, though out of sight, there was a clear, slow-moving stream, where dace were swimming in the pools under the willow-trees. The girl with dark hair was coming toward him across the field. With what seemed a single movement she tore off her clothes and flung them disdainfully aside. Her body was white and smooth, but it aroused no desire in him. Indeed, he barely looked at it. What overwhelmed him in that instant was admiration for the gesture with which she had thrown her clothes aside. With its grace and carelessness it seemed to annihilate a whole culture, a whole system of thought as though Big Brother and the party and the Thought Police could all be swept into nothingness by a single splendid movement of the arm. That, too, was a gesture belonging to the ancient time. Winston woke up with the word Shakespeare on his lips. The telescreen was giving forth an ear-splitting whistle, which continued on the same note for thirty seconds. It was not 7.15, getting up time for office workers. Winston wrenched his body out of bed, naked for a member of the outer party received only three thousand clothing coupons annually and a suit of pyjamas was six hundred, and seized a dingy singlet and a pair of shorts that were lying across a chair. The physical jerks would begin in three minutes. The next moment he was doubled up by a violent coughing fit, which nearly always attacked him soon after waking up. It emptied his lungs so completely that he could only begin breathing again by lying on his back and taking a series of deep gasps. His veins had swelled with the effort of the cough and the varicose ulcer had started itching. Thirty to forty group, yapped a piercing female voice. Thirty to forty group, take your places, please. Thirties to forties. Winston sprang to attention in front of the telescreen, upon which the image of a youngish woman, scrawny but muscular, dressed in tunic and gym shoes, had already appeared. Arms bending and stretching, she rapped out. Take your time by me. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Come on, comrades, put a bit of life into it. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. The pain of the coughing fit had not quite driven out of Winston's mind the impression made by his dream, and the rhythmic movements of the exercise restored it somewhat. As he mechanically shot his arms back and forth, wearing on his face the look of grim enjoyment which was considered proper during the physical jerks, he was struggling to think his way backward into the dim period of his early childhood. It was extraordinarily difficult. Beyond the late fifties everything faded. When there were no external records that you could refer to, even the outline of your own life lost its sharpness. You remembered huge events, which had quite probably not happened. You remembered the details of incidents without being able to recapture their atmosphere. And there were long, blank periods to which you could assign nothing. Everything had been different then. Even the names of countries and their shapes on the map had been different. Airstrip One, for instance, had not been so called in those days. It had been called England or Britain. Though London, he felt fairly certain, had always been called London. Winston could not definitely remember a time when his country had not been at war, but it was evident that there had been a fairly long interval of peace during his childhood, because one of his early memories was of an air raid which appeared to take everyone by surprise. Perhaps it was the time when the atomic bomb had fallen on Colchester. He did not remember the raid itself, 
But he did remember his father's hand clutching his own as they hurried down, 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 into some place deep in the earth, round and round a spiral staircase which rang under his feet and which finally so wearied his legs that he began whimpering and they had to stop and rest. His mother, in her slow, dreamy way, was following a long way behind them. She was carrying his baby sister. Or perhaps it was only a bundle of blankets that she was carrying. He was not certain whether his sister had been born then. Finally they had emerged.